It's about the March on Washington. King was the lead up to A. Philip Randolph's speech. It was Randolph who came out at the close of the march and gave people their instructions on what to do. And so here's this guy, yet he couldn't stop himself from going out to the barber shops and the beauty shops to organize and to tell people, you know, you've got to do this, you've got to be involved, you've got to come down to Washington, D.C. And the other thing that he did that was incredible and epic was that he always went, you know, if you look for A. Philip Randolph on a Friday night, or Saturday morning, you'd find him at a synagogue. Randolph wasn't Jewish. But he believed in building coalitions, going across racial lines, going across religious lines, going across class lines. And there's an incredible story about the March on Washington. The woman who wrote the, the poem that's the inscription on the Statue of Liberty, the oh, wow. retired poor, that woman was a New Yorker, a Jewish woman named Emma Lazarus. And Emma Lazarus, as a young girl, became committed to social democracy, to radical change. She died very, very young. Left this, left these poems, including the one that was on, it's on Statue of Liberty. And radical women in New York City, Jewish women, or formed what were called Emma Lazarus Societies. And this was, these were mostly younger women in the 1910s, 19-teens. And the, they started organizing all over the country. There's Emma Lazarus societies all over the country, Jewish women. And they called themselves the Emmas. And even when they got really, really old, like in their 70s and their 80s and their 90s, they still went to their meetings and they called themselves the Emmas. And when A. Philip Randolph called the March on Washington, if you looked out from the stage and you saw mostly, it's absolutely true, mostly African-American faces come on the buses and the trains from all over. But if you looked out, you know, you'd see UAW members because Walter Ruther believed passionately in supporting his struggle. You would see members of 1199, hospital workers, because they, uh, Davis, believes, Leon Davis, the head of the hospital workers, believed passionately in this struggle. But mostly it's African American faces. Then right there in the front, right there, got there early because it was their nature, um, with their picnic baskets, was a bunch of old ladies with white hair. And they had a big banner up and said the Emma Lazarus Society. And it was the Emmas. And the fact of the matter is that they loved A. Philip Randolph because he always came to their meetings. He always spoke to them. He came to their synagogues. He came to their community centers. And they recognized him as part of what they were all about. We don't often recognize how important that is. That going to those meetings, showing up even when there's a small group of folks, telling them that they matter, that they're part of something, they'll show up when you need them. And the fact of the matter is, there was nothing more beautiful. When I wrote my book on, on social democracy, I opened it up with a chapter about, uh, I worked in the lunchroom at my kid's uh, school. And when she was in kindergarten, I was writing a book. And most of the kids thought I worked in the lunchroom. They didn't know I did anything else. <laughs> and, no, I'm not kidding. And in fact, one time, and there's a couple of doctors that were parents of one of the kids. And one of these women came up to me, and she said, she had seen me on TV, and she said, she said, I know this is crazy, but my kid insists you work in the lunchroom. <laughs> I said, I do. I work, in, I work every day in the lunchroom. I, you know, open yogurts. And, um, and once the kids asked me, well, what, what else do you do aside from help us open yogurt? And, and I said, well, I, I write books. And, and they said, well, what do you write about? And I said, I'm writing about writing about social democracy and writing about building movements and, and you know radical change and stuff like that, which didn't mean a lot to kindergartners. And, <laughs> and, and then I told them the story about the Emmas. And when I opened the book, the first chapter is uh, my daughter Whitman's best buddy or little buddy was named Sylvie. And Whitman's grandmother uh, was one of her best friends that's here in the crowd tonight. Whitman's grandmother is a, the daughter of Wisconsin progressives. 
grown up you know, in the La Follette tradition of you know, radical social justice activism. Sylvie's grandmother uh, was an Italian immigrant uh, who was a, a, a radical who had come from Italy, fleeing Mussolini. And, um, and what I said to him is, you know, I'm writing a book about your grandmothers. And I'm writing a book about how I hope that you guys will grow up to be like your grandmothers. And so the first, I opened it up, the first chapter is Whitman, Sylvie, and the Endless. And bottom line is, I believe that we have a wondrous, glorious, radical tradition in this country. It's not written about, it's not talked about, and yet we're all a part of it. And I think right now, almost everything we fought for is under attack. But I also think that those who built the things that are under attack now fought harder battles. We can defend what's under assault much more easily than those who built those institutions. So we've got to fight ahead of us. What a cool fight. What a great fight to become a part of. And what a wondrous moment it's going to be when we have, if we've got to go to Washington, if we've got to go to Washington this August to demand a constitutional amendment to guarantee the right to vote for all Americans because the Supreme Court has thrown out the vote. If we've got to go and do that, if we've got to get on the buses, get on the trains, and get on the planes once more, won't it be a wonderful thing when we see the grandchildren of those folks that Martin Luther King Jr. imagined, you know, little white girl, little black kid up on you know, the mountaintop, and if right next to them we see the grandchildren of the Yemis, and they're all there once more, I think we can do it. I think we can. I think we have it in us, because we were called into being as a country by Tom Paine. And you know what Tom Paine said when everybody lost their nerve? He said, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Mm -hmm. Thank you.